We'd like to welcome everyone to the FP Network, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together. Second Kings chapter 1, the New Century Version. After Ahab died, Moab broke away from Israel's rule. Ahaziah fell down through the wooden bars in his upstairs room in Samaria and was badly hurt. He sent messengers and told them, Go ask Baal Zebub, god of Ekron, if I will recover from my injuries. But the Lord's angel said to Elijah the Tishbite, Go up and meet the messengers sent by the king of Samaria. Ask them, Why are you going to ask questions of Baal Zebub, god of Ekron? Is it because you think there is no God in Israel? This is what the Lord says. You will never get up from the bed you are lying on. You will die. Then Elijah left. When the messengers returned to Ahaziah, he asked them, Why have you returned? They said, A man came to meet us. He said, Go back to the king who sent you and tell him what the Lord says. Why do you send messengers to ask questions of Baal Zebub, god of Ekron? Is it because you think there is no God in Israel? You will never get up from the bed you are lying on. You will die. Ahaziah asked them, What did the man look like who met you and told you this? They answered, He was a hairy man and wore a leather belt around his waist. Ahaziah said, It was Elijah the Tishbite. Then he sent a captain with his fifty men to Elijah. The captain went to Elijah, who was sitting on top of the hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, Come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and burn up you and your fifty men. Then fire came down from heaven and burned up the captain and his fifty men. Ahaziah sent another captain and fifty men to Elijah. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says. Come down quickly. Elijah answered, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and burn up you and your fifty men. Then fire came down from heaven and burned up the captain and his fifty men. Ahaziah then sent a third captain with his fifty men. The third captain came and fell down on his knees before Elijah and begged, Man of God, please respect my life and the lives of your fifty servants. See, fire came down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of fifty with all their men. But now, respect my life. The Lord's angel said to Elijah, Go down with him and don't be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to see the king. Elijah told Ahaziah, This is what the Lord says. You have sent messengers to ask questions of Baal Zebub, god of Ekron. Is it because you think there is no god in Israel to ask? Because of this, you will never get up from your bed. You will die. So Ahaziah died just as the Lord through Elijah had said he would. Joram became king in Ahaziah's place during the second year Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, was king of Judah. Joram ruled because Ahaziah had no son to take his place. The other things Ahaziah did are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Chapter 2 It was almost time for the Lord to take Elijah by a whirlwind up into heaven. While Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal, Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here. The Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The groups of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know the Lord will take your master away from you today? Elisha said, Yes, I know, but don't talk about it. Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you live, I won't leave you. So they went to Jericho. The groups of prophets at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? Elisha answered, Yes, I know, but don't talk about it. 
Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan River. Elisha answered, As the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the groups of prophets came and stood far from where Elijah and Elisha were by the Jordan. Elijah took off his coat, rolled it up, and hit the water. The water divided to the right and to the left, and Elijah and Elisha crossed over on dry ground. After they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, What can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, Leave me a double share of your spirit. Elijah said, You have asked a hard thing, but if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. If you don't, it won't happen. As they were walking and talking, a chariot and horses of fire appeared and separated Elijah from Elisha. Then Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw it and shouted, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha did not see him any more. Then Elisha grabbed his own clothes and tore them to show how sad he was. He picked up Elijah's coat that had fallen from him. Then he returned and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Elisha hit the water with Elijah's coat and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he hit the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. The groups of prophets at Jericho were watching and said, Elisha now has the spirit Elijah had. And they came to meet him, bowing down to the ground before him. They said to him, There are fifty strong men with us. Please let them go and look for your master. Maybe the Spirit of the Lord has taken Elijah up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. But Elisha answered, No, don't send them. When the groups of prophets had begged Elisha until he couldn't refuse them any more, he said, Send them. So they sent fifty men who looked for three days, but they could not find him. Then they came back to Elisha at Jericho, where he was staying. He said to them, I told you not to go, didn't I? The people of the city said to Elisha, Look, master, this city is a nice place to live, as you can see. But the water is so bad the land cannot grow crops. Elisha said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt in it. He said, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. From now on it won't cause death and it won't keep the land from growing crops. So the water has been healed to this day, just as Elisha had said. From there Elisha went up to Bethel. On the way some boys came out of the city and made fun of him. They said to him, Go up too, you bald head. Go up too, you bald head. Elisha turned around, looked at them, and put a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two mother bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of the boys to pieces. Elisha went to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Chapter 3 Joram, son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in Jehoshaphat's eighteenth year as king of Judah. And Joram ruled twelve years. He did what the Lord said was wrong, but he was not like his father and mother. He removed the stone pillars his father had made for Baal. But he continued to sin like Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had led Israel to sin. Joram did not stop doing these same sins. Mesha, king of Moab, raised sheep. He paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 sheep. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab turned against the king of Israel. So King Joram went out from Samaria and gathered Israel's army. He also sent messengers to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has turned against me, he said. Will you go with me to fight Moab? Jehoshaphat replied, I will go with you. My soldiers and my horses are yours. Jehoshaphat asked, Which way should we attack? 
Joram answered, Through the desert of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After they had marched seven days, there was no more water for the army or for their animals that were with them. The king of Israel said, This is terrible. The Lord has called us three kings together to hand us over to the Moabites. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there a prophet of the Lord here? We can ask the Lord through him. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He was Elijah's servant. Jehoshaphat said, He speaks the Lord's truth. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to see Elisha. Elisha said to the king of Israel, I have nothing to do with you. Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. The king of Israel said to Elisha, No, the Lord has called us three kings together to hand us over to the Moabites. Elisha said, As surely as the Lord all-powerful lives, whom I serve, I tell you the truth. I wouldn't even look at you or notice you if Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were not here. I respect him. Now bring me someone who plays the harp. While the harp was being played, the Lord gave Elisha power. Then Elisha said, The Lord says to dig holes in the valley. The Lord says you won't see wind or rain, but the valley will be filled with water. Then you, your cattle, and your other animals can drink. This is easy for the Lord to do. He will also hand Moab over to you. You will destroy every strong walled city and every important town. You will cut down every good tree and stop up all springs. You will ruin every good field with rocks. The next morning, about the time the sacrifice was offered, water came from the direction of Edom and filled the valley. All the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, so they gathered everyone old enough to put on armor and waited at the border. But when the Moabites got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. They saw the water across from them, and it looked as red as blood. Then they said, This is blood! The kings must have fought and killed each other. Come, Moabites, let's take the valuables from the dead bodies. When the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites came out and fought them until they ran away. Then the Israelites went on into the land, killing the Moabites. They tore down the cities and threw rocks all over every good field. They stopped up all the springs and cut down all the good trees. Kir Haraseth was the only city with its stones still in place, but the men with slingshots surrounded it and conquered it too. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was too much for him, he took 700 men with swords to try to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not break through. Then the king of Moab took his oldest son, who would have been a king after him, and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. So there was great anger against the Israelites, who left and went back to their own land. Chapter 4 The wife of a man from the groups of prophets said to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You know he honored the Lord, but now the man he owes money to is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha answered, How can I help you? Tell me what you have in your house. The woman said, I don't have anything there except a pot of oil. Then Elisha said, Go and get empty jars from all your neighbors. Don't ask for just a few. Then go into your house and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and set the full ones aside. So she left Elisha and shut the door behind her and her sons. As they brought the jars to her, she poured out the oil. When the jars were all full, she said to her son, Bring me another jar. But he said, There are no more jars. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told Elisha, and the prophet said to her, Go, sell the oil and pay what you owe. You and your sons can live on what is left. One day Elisha went to Shunem, where an important woman lived. She begged Elisha to stay and eat, 
So every time Elisha passed by, he stopped there to eat. The woman said to her husband, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by our house all the time. Let's make a small room on the roof and put a bed in the room for him. We can put a table, a chair, and a lampstand there. Then when he comes by, he can stay there. One day, Elisha came to the woman's house. After he went to his room and rested, he said to his servant Gehazi, Call the Shunammite woman. When the servant had called her, she stood in front of him. Elisha had told his servant, Now say to her, You have gone to all this trouble for us. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak to the king or the commander of the army for you? She answered, I live among my own people. Elisha said to Gehazi, But what can we do for her? He answered, She has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Call her. When he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then Elisha said, About this time next year you will hold a son in your arms. The woman said, No, master, man of God, don't lie to me, your servant. But the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son at that time the next year, just as Elisha had told her. The boy grew up and one day went out to his father, who was with the grain harvesters. The boy said to his father, My head, my head. The father said to his servant, Take him to his mother. The servant took him to his mother, and he lay on his mother's lap until noon. Then he died. So she took him up and laid him on Elisha's bed. Then she shut the door and left. She called to her husband, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys, then I can go quickly to the man of God and return. The husband said, Why do you want to go to him today? It isn't the new moon or the Sabbath day. She said, It will be all right. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she went to Elisha, the man of God, at Mount Carmel. When he saw her coming from far away, he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite woman. Run to meet her and ask, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is the boy all right? She answered, Everything is all right. Then she came to Elisha at the hill and grabbed his feet. Gehazi came near to pull her away, but Elisha said to him, Leave her alone. She's very upset, and the Lord has not told me about it. He has hidden it from me. She said, Master, did I ask you for a son? Didn't I tell you not to lie to me? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Get ready, take my walking stick in your hand and go quickly. If you meet anyone, don't say hello. If anyone greets you, don't respond. Lay my walking stick on the boy's face. The boy's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So Elisha got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the walking stick on the boy's face, but the boy did not talk or move. Then Gehazi went back to meet Elisha. The boy has not awakened, he said. When Elisha came into the house, the boy was lying dead on his bed. Elisha entered the room and shut the door, so only he and the boy were in the room. Then he prayed to the Lord. He went to the bed and lay on the boy, putting his mouth on the boy's mouth, his eyes on the boy's eyes, and his hands on the boy's hands. He stretched himself out on top of the boy. Soon the boy's skin became warm. Elisha turned away and walked around the room. Then he went back and put himself on the boy again. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he did. When she came, Elisha said, Pick up your son. She came in and fell at Elisha's feet, bowing face down to the floor. Then she picked up her son and went out. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a shortage of food in the land. While the groups of prophets were sitting in front of him, he said to his servant, Put the large pot on the fire and boil some stew for these men. One of them went out into the field to gather plants. Finding a wild vine, he picked fruit from the vine and filled his robe with it. Then he came and cut up the fruit into the pot. 
but they didn't know what kind of fruit it was. They poured out the stew for the others to eat. When they began to eat, they shouted, Man of God, there's death in the pot, and they could not eat it. Elisha told them to bring some flour. He threw it into the pot and said, Pour it out for the people to eat. Then there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man from Baal Shalisha came to Elisha, bringing him 20 loaves of barley bread from the first harvest. He also brought fresh grain in his sack. Elisha said, Give it to the people to eat. Elisha's servant asked, How can I feed a hundred people with so little? Give the bread to the people to eat, Elisha said. This is what the Lord says. They will eat and will have food left over. After he gave it to them, the people ate and had food left over, as the Lord had said. Chapter 5 Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was honored by his master, and he had much respect, because the Lord used him to give victory to Aram. He was a mighty and brave man, but he had a skin disease. The Arameans had gone out to raid the Israelites and had taken a little girl as captive. This little girl served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish my master would meet the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his disease. Naaman went to the king and told him what the girl from Israel had said. The king of Aram said, Go ahead, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left and took with him about 750 pounds of silver, as well as 150 pounds of gold and 10 changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so you can heal him of his skin disease. Then the king of Israel read the letter. He tore his clothes to show how upset he was. He said, I'm not God. I can't kill and make alive again. Why does this man send someone with a skin disease for me to heal? You can see that the king of Aram is trying to start trouble with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent the king this message. Why have you torn your clothes? Let Naaman come to me. Then he will know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots to Elisha's house and stood outside the door. Elisha sent Naaman a messenger who said, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. Then your skin will be healed and you will be clean. Naaman became angry and left. He said, I thought Elisha would surely come out and stand before me and call on the name of the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over the place and heal the disease. The Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, are better than all the waters of Israel. Why can't I wash in them and become clean? So Naaman went away very angry. Naaman's servants came near and said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Doesn't it make more sense just to do it? After all, he only told you, wash and you will be clean. So Naaman went down and dipped in the Jordan seven times, just as Elisha had said. Then his skin became new again, like the skin of a child, and he was clean. Naaman and all his group returned to Elisha. He stood before Elisha and said, Look, I now know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now please accept a gift from me. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I won't accept anything. Naaman urged him to take the gift, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If you won't take the gift, then please give me some soil, as much as two of my mules can carry. From now on, I'll not offer any burnt offering or sacrifice to any other gods but the Lord. But let the Lord pardon me for this. When my master goes into the temple of Remen to worship, he leans on my arm. Then I must bow in that temple. May the Lord pardon me when I do that. Elisha said to him, Go in peace. Naaman left Elisha and went a short way. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, 
My master has not accepted what Naaman the Aramean brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi went after Naaman. When Naaman saw someone running after him, he got off the chariot to meet Gehazi. He asked, Is everything all right? Gehazi said, Everything is all right. My master has sent me. He said, Two young men from the groups of prophets in the mountains of Ephraim just came to me. Please give them seventy-five pounds of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, Please take one hundred fifty pounds, and he urged Gehazi to take it. He tied one hundred fifty pounds of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes. Then he gave them to two of his servants to carry for Gehazi. When they came to the hill, Gehazi took these things from Naaman's servants and put them in the house. Then he let Naaman's servants go, and they left. When he came in and stood before his master, Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I didn't go anywhere, he answered. But Elisha said to him, My spirit was with you. I knew when the man turned from his chariot to meet you. This isn't a time to take money, clothes, olives, grapes, sheep, oxen, male servants, or female servants. So Naaman's skin disease will come on you and your children forever. When Gehazi left Elisha, he had the disease and was as white as snow. Chapter 6 The groups of prophets said to Elisha, The place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan River. There everyone can get a log and let's build a place there to live. Elisha said, Go. One of them said, Please go with us. Elisha answered, I will go. So he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they cut down some trees. As one man was cutting down a tree, the head of his axe fell into the water. He yelled, Oh, my master, I borrowed that axe. Elisha asked, Where did it fall? The man showed him the place. Then Elisha cut down a stick and threw it into the water, and it made the iron head float. Elisha said, Pick up the axe head. Then the man reached out and took it. The king of Aram was at war with Israel. He had a council meeting with his officers and said, I will set up my camp in this place. Elisha, the man of God, sent a message to the king of Israel, saying, Be careful. Don't pass that place because the Arameans are going down there. The king of Israel checked the place about which Elisha had warned him. Elisha warned him several times, so the king protected himself there. The king of Aram was angry about this. He called his officers together and demanded, Tell me, who of us is working for the king of Israel? One of the officers said, None, my master and king. It's Elisha the prophet from Israel. He can tell you what you speak in your bedroom. The king said, Go and find him so I can send men and catch him. The servants came back and reported, He is in Dothan. Then the king sent horses, chariots, and many troops to Dothan. They arrived at night and surrounded the city. Elisha's servant got up early, and when he went out, he saw an army with horses and chariots all around the city. The servant said to Elisha, O oh, my master, what can we do? Elisha said, Don't be afraid. The army that fights for us is larger than the one against us. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, open my servant's eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward Elisha, he prayed to the Lord, Make these people blind. So he made the Aramean army blind, as Elisha had asked. Elisha said to them, This is not the right road or the right city. Follow me, and I'll take you to the man you are looking for. Then Elisha led them to Samaria. After they entered Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open these men's eyes so they can see. 
So the Lord opened their eyes, and the Aramean army saw that they were inside the city of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw the Aramean army, he said to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Elisha answered, Don't kill them. You wouldn't kill people whom you captured with your sword and bow. Give them food and water and let them eat and drink and then go home to their master. So he prepared a great feast for the Aramean army. After they ate and drank, the king sent them away and they went home to their master. The soldiers of Aram did not come any more into the land of Israel. Later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered his whole army and surrounded and attacked Samaria. There was a shortage of food in Samaria. It was so bad that a donkey's head sold for about two pounds of silver, and half of a pint of dove's dung sold for about two ounces of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman yelled out to him, Help me, my master and king. The king said, If the Lord doesn't help you, how can I? Can I get help from the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is your trouble? She answered, This woman said to me, Give up your son so we can eat him today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. Then the next day I said to her, Give up your son so we can eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his clothes in grief. As he walked along the wall, the people looked and saw he had on rough cloth under his clothes to show his sadness. He said, May God punish me terribly if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, isn't cut off from his body today. The king sent a messenger to Elisha, who was sitting in his house with the elders. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to them, See, this murderer is sending men to cut off my head. When the messenger arrives, shut the door and hold it. Don't let him in. The sound of his master's feet is behind him. Elisha was still talking with the leaders when the messenger arrived. The king said, This trouble has come from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Chapter 7 Elisha said, Listen to the Lord's word. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, seven quarts of fine flour will be sold for two-fifths of an ounce of silver, and thirteen quarts of barley will be sold for two-fifths of an ounce of silver. This will happen at the gate of Samaria. Then the officer, who was close to the king, answered Elisha, Even if the Lord opened windows in the sky, that couldn't happen. Elisha said, You will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat any of it. There were four men with a skin disease at the entrance to the city gate. They said to each other, Why do we sit here until we die? There is no food in the city, so if we go into the city, we will die there. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go to the Aramean camp. If they let us live, we will live. If they kill us, we die. So they got up at twilight and went to the Aramean camp. But when they arrived, no one was there. The Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a large army. They had said to each other, The king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and ran away in the twilight, leaving their tents, horses, and donkeys. They left the camp standing and ran for their lives. When the men with the skin disease came to the edge of the camp, they went into one of the tents and ate and drank. They carried silver, gold, and clothes out of the camp and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent. They carried things from this tent and hid them also. Then they said to each other, We're doing wrong. Today we have good news, but we are silent. If we wait until the sun comes up, we'll be discovered. Let's go right now and tell the people in the king's palace. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city. They said, We went to the Aramean camp, but no one is there. We didn't hear anyone. 
The horses and donkeys were still tied up and the tents were still standing. Then the gatekeepers shouted out and told the people in the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I'll tell you what the Arameans are doing to us. They know we are starving. They have gone out of the camp to hide in the field. They're saying, when the Israelites come out of the city, we'll capture them alive. Then we'll enter the city. One of his officers answered, Let some men take five of the horses that are still left in the city. These men are like all the Israelites who are left. They are also about to die. Let's send them to see what has happened. So the men took two chariots with horses. The king sent them after the Aramean army, saying, Go and see what has happened. The men followed the Aramean army as far as the Jordan River. The road was full of clothes and equipment that the Arameans had thrown away as they hurriedly left. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and took valuables from the Aramean camp. So seven quarts of fine flour were sold for two-fifths of an ounce of silver, and thirteen quarts of barley were sold for two-fifths of an ounce of silver, just as the Lord had said. The king chose the officer who was close to him to guard the gate, but the people trampled the officer to death. This happened just as Elisha had told the king when the king came to his house. He had said, Thirteen quarts of barley and seven quarts of fine flour will each sell for two-fifths of an ounce of silver about this time tomorrow at the gate of Samaria. But the officer had answered, Even if the Lord opened windows in the sky, that couldn't happen. And Elisha had told him, You will see it with your eyes, but you won't eat any of it. It happened to the officer just that way. The people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Chapter 8 Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had brought back to life. He said, Get up and go with your family. Stay any place you can, because the Lord has called for a time without food that will last seven years. So the woman got up and did as the man of God had said. She left with her family, and they stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After seven years... She returned from the land of the Philistines and went to beg the king for her house and land. The king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had said, Please tell me all the great things Elisha has done. Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had brought a dead boy back to life. Just then, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came and begged the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, my master and king, this is the woman, and this is the son Elisha brought back to life. The king asked the woman, and she told him about it. Then the king chose an officer to help her. Give the woman everything that is hers, the king said. Give her all the money made from her land from the day she left until now. Then Elisha went to Damascus, where Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick. Someone told him, the man of God has arrived. The king said to Hazael, Take a gift in your hand and go meet him. Ask the Lord through him if I will recover from my sickness. So Hazael went to meet Elisha, taking with him a gift of forty camels loaded with every good thing in Damascus. He came and stood before Elisha and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, sent me to you. He asks if he will recover from his sickness. Elisha said to Hazael, Go and tell Ben-Hadad, you will surely recover. But the Lord has told me he will really die. Hazael stared at Elisha until he felt ashamed. Then Elisha cried. Hazael asked, Why are you crying, master? Elisha answered, because I know what evil you will do to the Israelites. You will burn their strong, walled cities with fire and kill their young men with swords. You will throw their babies to the ground and split open their pregnant women. Hazael said, Am I a dog? How could I do such things? Elisha answered, 
The Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. Then Hazael left Elisha and came to his master. Ben-Hadad said to him, What did Elisha say to you? Hazael answered, He told me that you will surely recover. But the next day, Hazael took a blanket and dipped it in water. Then he put it over Ben-Hadad's face, and he died. So Hazael became king in Ben-Hadad's place. While Jehoshaphat was king in Judah, Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, became king of Judah. This was during the fifth year Joram, son of Ahab, was king of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled eight years in Jerusalem. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel just as the family of Ahab had done, because he married Ahab's daughter. Jehoram did what the Lord said was wrong, but the Lord would not destroy Judah because of his servant David. The Lord had promised that one of David's descendants would always rule. In Jehoram's time, Edom broke away from Judah's rule and chose their own king. So Jehoram and all his chariots went to Zaire. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders. Jehoram got up and attacked the Edomites at night, but his army ran away to their tents. From then until now, the country of Edom has fought against the rule of Judah. At the same time, Libna also broke away from Judah's rule. The other acts of Jehoram and all the things he did are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Jehoram died and was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem, and Jehoram's son Ahaziah ruled in his place. Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, became king of Judah during the twelfth year Joram, son of Ahab, was king of Israel. Ahaziah was twenty-two years old when he became king, and he ruled one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, a granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. Ahaziah followed the ways of Ahab's family. He did what the Lord said was wrong as Ahab's family had done because he was a son-in-law to Ahab. Ahaziah went with Joram, son of Ahab, to Ramoth in Gilead, where they fought against Hazael, king of Aram. The Arameans wounded Joram. So King Joram returned to Jezreel to heal from the wound he had received from the Arameans at Ramoth when he fought Hazael, king of Aram. Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to visit Joram, son of Ahab, at Jezreel, because he had been wounded. Chapter 9 At the same time, Elisha the prophet called a man from the groups of prophets. Elisha said, Get ready and take this small bottle of olive oil in your hand. Go to Ramoth and Gilead. When you arrive, find Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go in and make Jehu get up from among his brothers and take him to an inner room. Then take the bottle and pour the oil on Jehu's head and say, This is what the Lord says, I have appointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and run away. Don't wait. So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth and Gilead. When he arrived, he saw the officers of the army sitting together. He said, Commander, I have a message for you. Jehu asked, For which one of us? The young man said, For you, Commander. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the young prophet poured the olive oil on Jehu's head and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have appointed you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You must destroy the family of Ahab, your master. I will punish Jezebel for the deaths of my servants, the prophets, and for all the Lord's servants who were murdered. All of Ahab's family must die. I will not let any male child in Ahab's family live in Israel, whether slave or free. I will make Ahab's family like the family of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the family of Baasha, son of Ahijah. The dogs will eat Jezebel at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then the young prophet opened the door and ran away. When Jehu went back to his master's officers, one of them said to Jehu, 
Is everything all right? Why did this crazy man come to you? Jehu answered, You know the man and how he talks. They answered, That's not true. Tell us. Jehu said, He said to me, This is what the Lord says. I have appointed you to be king over Israel. Then the officers hurried, and each man took off his own coat and put it on the stairs for Jehu. They blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, made plans against Joram. Now Joram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth and Gilead from Hazael, king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to heal from his injuries the Arameans had given him when he fought against Hazael, king of Aram. Jehu said, If you agree with this, don't let anyone leave the city. They might tell the news in Jezreel. Then he got into his chariot and set out for Jezreel, where Joram was resting. Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. The lookout was standing on the watchtower in Jezreel when he saw Jehu's troops coming. He said, I see some soldiers. Joram said, Take a horseman and send him to meet them. Tell him to ask, Is all in order? The horseman rode out to meet Jehu, and he said, This is what the king says. Is all in order? Jehu said, Why bother yourself with order? Come along behind me. The lookout reported, The messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then Joram sent out a second horseman. The rider came to Jehu's group and said, This is what the king says. Is all in order? Jehu answered, Why bother yourself with order? Come along behind me. The lookout reported, The second man reached them, but he is not coming back. The man in the chariot is driving like Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives as if he were crazy. Joram said, Get my chariot ready. Then the servant got Joram's chariot ready. Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his own chariot, to meet Jehu at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is all in order, Jehu? Jehu answered, there will never be any order as long as your mother Jezebel worships idols and uses witchcraft. Joram turned the horses to run away and yelled to Ahaziah, It's a trick, Ahaziah. Then Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between his shoulders. The arrow went through Joram's heart and he fell down in his chariot. Jehu ordered Bidkar, his chariot officer, Pick up Joram's body and throw it into the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember when you and I rode together with Joram's father, Ahab? The Lord made this prophecy against him. Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and his sons, says the Lord, so I will punish Ahab in his field, says the Lord. Take Joram's body and throw it into the field, as the Lord has said. When Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he ran away toward Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him, saying, Shoot Ahaziah too. Ahaziah was wounded in his chariot on the way up to Gur near Iblium. He got as far as Megiddo, but died there. Ahaziah's servants carried his body in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his ancestors in his tomb in Jerusalem. Ahaziah had become king over Judah in the eleventh year Joram, son of Ahab, was king. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard about it. She put on her eye makeup and fixed her hair. Then she looked out the window. When Jehu entered the city gate, Jezebel said, Have you come in peace, you Zimri, you who killed your master? Jehu looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three servants looked out the window at Jehu. He said to them, Throw her down. So they threw Jezebel down, and the horses ran over her. Some of her blood splashed on the wall and on the horses. Jehu went into the house and ate and drank. Then he said, Now see about this cursed woman. Bury her, because she is a king's daughter. The men went to bury Jezebel, but they could not find her. They found only her skull, feet, and the palms of her hands. 
When they came back and told Jehu, he said, The Lord said this through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. The dogs will eat Jezebel at Jezreel. Her body will be like manure on the field in the land at Jezreel. No one will be able to say that this is Jezebel. Chapter 10 Ahab had seventy sons in Samaria. Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the officers and elders of Jezreel and to the guardians of the sons of Ahab. Jehu said, You have your master's sons with you, and you have chariots, horses, a city with strong walls and weapons. When you get this letter, choose the best and most worthy person among your master's sons and make him king. Then fight for your master's family. But the officers and leaders of Jezreel were frightened. They said, Two kings could not stand up to Jehu, so how can we? The palace manager, the city governor, the leaders, and the guardians sent a message to Jehu. We are your servants, they said. We will do everything you tell us to do. We won't make any man king, so do whatever you think is best. Then Jehu wrote a second letter saying, If you are on my side and will obey me, cut off the heads of your master's sons and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow about this time. Now the seventy sons of the king's family were with the leading men of the city who were their guardians. When the leaders received the letter, they took the king's sons and killed all seventy of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu at Jezreel. The messenger came to Jehu and told him, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. Then Jehu said, Lay the heads in two piles at the city gate until morning. In the morning, Jehu went out and stood before the people and said to them, You are innocent. Look, I made plans against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? You should know that everything the Lord said about Ahab's family will come true. The Lord has spoken through his servant Elijah, and the Lord has done what he said. So Jehu killed every one of Ahab's family in Jezreel who was still alive. He also killed all Ahab's leading men, close friends, and priests. No one who had helped Ahab was left alive. Then Jehu left and went to Samaria by way of the road to beth Echid of the shepherds. There Jehu met some relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah. Jehu asked, Who are you? They answered, We are relatives of Ahaziah. We have come down to get revenge for the families of the king and the king's mother. Then Jehu said, Take them alive. So they captured Ahaziah's relatives alive and killed them at the well near beth Echid. Forty-two of them. Jehu did not leave anyone alive. After Jehu left there, he met Jehonadab, son of Rechab, who was also on his way to meet Jehu. Jehu greeted him and said, Are you as good a friend to me as I am to you? Jehonadab answered, Yes, I am. Jehu said, If you are, then give me your hand. So Jehonadab gave him his hand, and Jehu pulled him into the chariot. Come with me, Jehu said. You can see how strong my feelings are for the Lord. So Jehu had Jehonadab ride in his chariot. When Jehu came to Samaria, he killed all of Ahab's family in Samaria. He destroyed all those who were left, just as the Lord had told Elijah it would happen. When Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve Baal much. Now call for me all Baal's prophets and priests and all the people who worship Baal. Don't let anyone miss this meeting because I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Anyone who is not there will not live. But Jehu was tricking them so he could destroy the worshipers of Baal. He said, prepare a holy meeting for Baal. So they announced the meeting. Then Jehu sent word through all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came. Not one stayed home. 
They came into the temple of Baal, and the temple was filled from one side to the other. Jehu said to the man who kept the robes, Bring out robes for all the worshipers of Baal. After he brought out robes for them, Jehu and Jehonadab, son of Rechab, went into the temple of Baal. Jehu said to the worshipers of Baal, Look around and make sure there are no servants of the Lord with you. Be sure there are only worshipers of Baal. Then the worshipers of Baal went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Jehu had 80 men waiting outside. He had told them, Don't let anyone escape. If you do, you must pay with your own life. As soon as Jehu finished offering the burnt offering, he ordered the guards and the captains, Go in and kill the worshipers of Baal. Don't let anyone come out. So the guards and captains killed the worshipers of Baal with the sword and threw their bodies out. Then they went to the inner rooms of the temple and brought out the pillars of the temple of Baal and burned them. They tore down the stone pillar of Baal as well as the temple of Baal, and they made it into a sewage pit as it is today. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel, but he did not stop doing the sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had done. Jeroboam had led Israel to sin by worshiping the golden calves in Bethel and Dan. The Lord said to Jehu, You have done well in obeying what I said was right. You have done to the family of Ahab as I wanted. Because of this, your descendants, as far as your great-great-grandchildren, will be kings of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to follow the teachings of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not stop doing the same sins Jeroboam had done, by which he had led Israel to sin. At that time, the Lord began to make Israel smaller. Hazael defeated the Israelites in all the land of Israel, taking all the land of the Jordan known as the land of Gilead. It was the region of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. He took land from Aurora by the Arnon Ravine through Gilead to Bashan. The other things Jehu did, everything he did and all his victories, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jehu died and was buried in Samaria, and his son Jehoahaz became king in his place. Jehu was king over Israel and Samaria for 28 years. Chapter 11 When Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, saw that her son was dead, she killed all the royal family. But Jehosheba, King Jehoram's daughter and Ahaziah's sister, took Joash, Ahaziah's son. She stole him from among the other sons of the king who were about to be murdered. She put Joash and his nurse in a bedroom to hide them from Athaliah, so he was not killed. He hid with her in the temple of the Lord for six years. During that time, Athaliah ruled the land. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of groups of a hundred men, as well as the Karaites. He brought them together in the temple of the Lord and made an agreement with them. There, in the temple of the Lord, he made them promise loyalty, and then he showed them the king's son. He commanded them, This is what you must do. A third of you who go on duty on the Sabbath will guard the king's palace. A third of you will be at the sewer gate, and another third will be at the gate behind the guard. This way you will guard the temple. The two groups who go off duty on the Sabbath must protect the temple of the Lord for the king. All of you must stand around the king with weapons in hand. Kill anyone who comes near. Stay close to the king when he goes out and when he comes in. The commanders over a hundred men obeyed everything Jehoiada the priest had commanded. Each one took his men who came on duty on the Sabbath and those who went off duty on the Sabbath, and they came to Jehoiada the priest. He gave the commanders the spears and shields that had belonged to King David and that were kept in the temple of the Lord. Then each guard took his place with his weapons in his hand. 
There were guards from the south side of the temple to the north side. They stood by the altar in the temple and around the king. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him a copy of the agreement. They appointed him king and poured olive oil on him. Then they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king! When Athaliah heard the noise of the guards and the people, she went to them at the temple of the Lord. She looked, and there was the king, standing by the pillar, as the custom was. The officers and trumpeters were standing beside him, and all the people of the land were very happy and were blowing trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and screamed, Traitors! Traitors! Jehoiada the priest gave orders to the commander of a hundred men who led the army. He said, Surround her with soldiers and kill with a sword anyone who follows her. He commanded this because he had said, Don't put Athaliah to death in the temple of the Lord. So they caught her when she came to the horse's entrance near the palace. There she was put to death. Then Jehoiada made an agreement between the Lord and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's special people. He also made an agreement between the king and the people. All the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down, smashing the altars and idols. They also killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. Then Jehoiada, the priest, placed guards at the temple of the Lord. He took with him the commanders of a hundred men and the Karaites, the royal bodyguards, as well as the guards and all the people of the land. Together they took the king out of the temple of the Lord and went into the palace through the gate of the guards. Then the king sat on the royal throne. So all the people of the land were very happy, and Jerusalem had peace, because Athaliah had been put to death with a sword at the palace. Joash was seven years old when he became king. Chapter 12 Joash became king of Judah in Jehu's seventh year as king of Israel, and he ruled for forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah, and she was from Beersheba. Joash did what the Lord said was right as long as Jehoiada the priest taught him. But the places where gods were worshipped were not removed. The people still made sacrifices and burned incense there. Joash said to the priests, Take all the money brought as offerings to the temple of the Lord. This includes the money each person owes in taxes and the money each person promises or brings freely to the Lord. Each priest will take the money from the people he serves. Then the priests must repair any damage they find in the temple. By the 23rd year, Joash was king. The priests still had not repaired the temple. So King Joash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why aren't you repairing the damage of the temple? Don't take any more money from the people you serve, but hand over the money for the repair of the temple. The priests agreed not to take any more money from the people and not to repair the temple themselves. Jehoiada the priest took a box and made a hole in the top of it. Then he put it by the altar on the right side as the people came into the temple of the Lord. The priests guarding the doorway put all the money brought to the temple of the Lord into the box. Each time the priest saw that the box was full of money, the king's royal secretary and the high priest came. They counted the money that had been brought to the temple of the Lord, and they put it into bags. Next, they weighed the money and gave it to the people in charge of the work on the temple. With it, they paid the carpenters and the builders who worked on the temple of the Lord, as well as the bricklayers and stonecutters. They also used the money to buy timber and cut stone to repair the damage of the temple of the Lord. It paid for everything. The money brought into the temple of the Lord was not used to make silver cups, wick trimmers, bowls, trumpets, or gold or silver vessels. They paid the money to the workers who used it to repair the temple of the Lord. They did not demand to know how the money was spent because the workers were honest. The money from the penalty offerings and sin offerings was not brought into the temple of the Lord because it belonged to the priests. 
About this time, Hazael, king of Aram, attacked Gath and captured it. Then he went to attack Jerusalem. Joash, king of Judah, took all the holy things given by his ancestors, the kings of Judah, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaziah. He also took his own holy things as well as the gold that was found in the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and the gold from the palace. Joash sent all this treasure to Hazael, king of Aram, who turned away from Jerusalem. Everything else Joash did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. His officers made plans against him and killed him at Beth Milo on the road down to Silla. The officers who killed him were Josabad, son of Shimeath, and Jehozabad, son of Shomer. Joash was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem, and Amaziah, his son, became king in his place. We'd like to thank you for joining the FP Network today, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together. We'd like to welcome everyone to the FP Network, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together. The Book of 2 Kings, Chapter 13, The New Century Version Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria during the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, was king of Judah. Jehoahaz ruled 17 years, and he did what the Lord said was wrong. Jehoahaz did the same sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had done. Jeroboam had led Israel to sin, and Jehoahaz did not stop doing these same sins. So the Lord was angry with Israel and handed them over to Hazael, king of Aram, and his son Ben-Hadad for a long time. Then Jehoahaz begged the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. The Lord had seen the troubles of Israel. He saw how terribly the king of Aram was treating them. He gave Israel a man to save them, and they escaped from the Arameans. The Israelites then lived in their own homes as they had before, but they still did not stop doing the same sins that the family of Jeroboam had done. He had led Israel to sin, and they continued doing those sins. The Asherah idol also was left standing in Samaria. Nothing was left of Jehoahaz's army except fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand foot soldiers. The king of Aram had destroyed them and made them like chaff. Everything else Jehoahaz did and all his victories are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jehoahaz died and was buried in Samaria, and his son Jehoash became king in his place. Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, became king of Israel in Samaria during Joash's 37th year as king of Judah. Jehoash ruled 16 years, and he did what the Lord said was wrong. He did not stop doing the same sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had done. Jeroboam had led Israel to sin, and Jehoash continued to do the same thing. Everything else he did in all his victories, including his war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jehoash died, and Jeroboam took his place on the throne. Jehoash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. At this time, Elisha became sick. Before he died, Jehoash king of Israel, went to Elisha and cried for him. Jehoash said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Elisha said to Jehoash, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then Elisha said to him, Put your hand on the bow. So Jehoash put his hand on the bow. Then Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Elisha said, Open the east window. 
So Jehoash opened the window. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And Jehoash shot. Elisha said, The Lord's arrow of victory over Aram. You will defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you destroy them. Elisha said, Take the arrows. So Jehoash took them. Then Elisha said to him, Strike the ground. So Jehoash struck the ground three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him. You should have struck five or six times, Elisha said. Then you would have struck Aram until you had completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Then Elisha died and was buried. At that time, groups of Moabites would rob the land in the springtime. Once, as some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a group of Moabites coming. The Israelites threw the dead man into Elisha's grave. When the man touched Elisha's bones, the man came back to life and stood on his feet. During all the days Jehoahaz was king, Hazael, king of Aram, troubled Israel. But the Lord was kind to the Israelites. He had mercy on them and helped them because of his agreement with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To this day, he has never wanted to destroy them or reject them. When Hazael, king of Aram, died, his son Ben-Hadad became king in his place. During a war, Hazael had taken some cities from Jehoahaz, Jehoash's father. Now Jehoash took back those cities from Hazael's son Ben-Hadad. He defeated Ben-Hadad three times and took back the cities of Israel. Chapter 14 Amaziah, son of Joash, became king of Judah during the second year Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, was king of Israel. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother was named Jehoadan, and she was from Jerusalem. Amaziah did what the Lord said was right. He did everything his father Joash had done, but he did not do as his ancestor David had done. The places where gods were worshipped were not removed, so the people still sacrificed and burned incense there. As soon as Amaziah took control of the kingdom, he executed the officers who had murdered his father, the king. But he did not put to death the children of the murderers because of the rule written in the book of the teachings of Moses. The Lord had commanded, Parents must not be put to death when their children do wrong, and children must not be put to death when their parents do wrong. Each must die for his own sins. In battle, Amaziah killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He also took the city of Selah. He called it Jokthiel, as it is still called today. Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel. They said, Come, let's meet face to face. Then Jehoash, king of Israel, answered Amaziah, king of Judah. A thorn bush in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar tree in Lebanon. It said, Let your daughter marry my son. But then a wild animal from Lebanon came by, walking on and crushing the thorn bush. You have defeated Edom, but you have become proud. Stay at home and brag. Don't ask for trouble, or you and Judah will be defeated. But Amaziah would not listen, so Jehoash king of Israel went to attack. He and Amaziah king of Judah faced each other in battle at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Israel defeated Judah, and every man of Judah ran away to his home. At Beth Shemesh, Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah. Amaziah was the son of Joash, who was the son of Ahaziah. Jehoash went up to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, which was about 600 feet. He took all the gold and silver and all the utensils in the temple of the Lord, and he took the treasuries of the palace and some hostages. Then he returned to Samaria. The other acts of Jehoash and his victories, including his war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. 
Jehoash died and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and his son Jeroboam became king in his place. Amaziah, son of Joash, the king of Judah, lived fifteen years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, the king of Israel. The other things Amaziah did are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. The people in Jerusalem made plans against him. So he ran away to the town of Lachish, but they sent men after him to Lachish and killed him. They brought his body back on horses, and he was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem in the city of David. Then all the people of Judah made Uzziah king in place of his father Amaziah. Uzziah was sixteen years old. He rebuilt the town of Elath and made it part of Judah again after Amaziah died. Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel in Samaria during the fifteenth year Amaziah was king of Judah. Amaziah was the son of Joash. Jeroboam ruled forty-one years, and he did what the Lord said was wrong. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to sin, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, did not stop doing the same sins. Jeroboam won back Israel's border from Lebohamath to the Dead Sea. This happened as the Lord, the God of Israel, had said through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. The Lord had seen how the Israelites, both slave and free, were suffering terribly. No one was left who could help Israel. The Lord had not said he would completely destroy Israel from the world, so he saved the Israelites through Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. Everything else Jeroboam did is written down, all his victories and how he won back from Judah the towns of Damascus and Hamath for Israel. All this is written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jeroboam died and was buried with his ancestors, the kings of Israel. Jeroboam's son, Zechariah, became king in his place. Chapter 15 Uzziah, son of Amaziah, became king of Judah during Jeroboam's twenty-seventh year as king of Israel. Uzziah was sixteen years old when he became king, and he ruled fifty-two years in Jerusalem. His mother was named Jechaliah, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what the Lord said was right, just as his father Amaziah had done. But the places where gods were worshipped were not removed, so the people still made sacrifices and burned incense there. The Lord struck Uzziah with a skin disease, which he had until the day he died, so he had to live in a separate house. Jotham, the king's son, was in charge of the palace, and he governed the people of the land. All the other things Uzziah did are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Uzziah died and was buried near his ancestors in Jerusalem, and his son Jotham became king in his place. Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, was king over Israel in Samaria. He ruled for six months during Uzziah's thirty-eighth year as king of Judah. Zechariah did what the Lord said was wrong, just as his ancestors had done. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led the people of Israel to sin, and Zechariah did not stop doing the same sins. Shalom, son of Jabesh, made plans against Zechariah and killed him in front of the people. Then Shalom became king in his place. The other acts of Zechariah are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. The Lord had told Jehu, Your sons down to your great-great-grandchildren will be kings of Israel and the Lord's word came true. Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king during Uzziah's thirty-ninth year as king of Judah. Shalom ruled for a month in Samaria. Then Menahem, son of Gadai, came up from Tirzah to Samaria and attacked Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria. He killed him and became king in Shalom's place. The other acts of Shalom and his secret plans are written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Menahem started out from Tirzah and attacked Tifsah, destroying the city and the nearby area. This was because the people had refused to open the city gate for him. 
he defeated them and ripped open all of their pregnant women. Menahem, son of Gadai, became king over Israel during Uzziah's 39th year as king of Judah. Menahem ruled 10 years in Samaria, and he did what the Lord said was wrong. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to sin, and all the time Menahem was king, he did not stop doing the same sins. Pul, king of Assyria, came to attack the land. Menahem gave him about 74,000 pounds of silver, so Pul would support him and make his hold on the kingdom stronger. Menahem taxed Israel to pay about one and one-fourth pounds of silver to each soldier of the king of Assyria, so the king left and did not stay in the land. Everything else Menahem did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Then Menahem died, and his son Pekahiah became king in his place. Pekahiah, son of Menahem, became king over Israel in Samaria during Uzziah's 50th year as king of Judah. Pekahiah ruled two years, and he did what the Lord said was wrong. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to sin, and Pekahiah did not stop doing the same sins. Pekah, son of Remaliah, was one of Pekahiah's captains, and he made plans against Pekahiah. He took 50 men of Gilead with him and killed Pekahiah, as well as Argob and Ariah in the palace at Samaria. Then Pekah became king in Pekahiah's place. Everything else Pekahiah did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Pekah, son of Remaliah, became king over Israel in Samaria during Uzziah's 52nd year as king of Judah. Pekah ruled 20 years and he did what the Lord said was wrong. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to sin, and Pekah did not stop doing the same sins. Tiglath-Pileser was king of Assyria. He attacked while Pekah was king of Israel, capturing the cities of Ajon, Abelbeth Maaka, Genoa, Kedesh, and Hazor. He also captured Gilead and Galilee and all the land of Naphtali and carried the people away to Assyria. Then Hoshea, son of Elah, made plans against Pekah, son of Remaliah, and attacked and killed him. Then Hoshea became king in Pekah's place during the twentieth year. Jotham, son of Uzziah, was king. Everything else Pekah did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jotham, son of Uzziah, became king of Judah during the second year. Pekah, son of Remaliah, was king of Israel. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. Jotham did what the Lord said was right, just as his father Uzziah had done. But the places where gods were worshipped were not removed, and the people still made sacrifices and burned incense there. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. The other things Jotham did while he was king are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. At that time, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, against Judah. Jotham died and was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem, the city of David, his ancestor. Then Jotham's son, Ahaz, became king in his place. Chapter 16. Ahaz was the son of Jotham, king of Judah. Ahaz became king of Judah in the seventeenth year. Pekah, son of Remaliah, was king of Israel. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king, and he ruled sixteen years in Jerusalem. Unlike his ancestor David, he did not do what the Lord his God said was right. Ahaz did the same things the kings of Israel had done. He even made his son pass through fire. He did the same hateful sins as the nations had done whom the Lord had forced out of the land ahead of the Israelites. Ahaz offered sacrifices and burned incense at the places where gods were worshipped, on the hills and under every green tree. Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to attack Jerusalem. They surrounded Ahaz, but could not defeat him. 
At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, took back the city of Elath for Aram, and he forced out all the people of Judah. Then Edomites moved into Elath, and they still live there today. Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath pileser king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your friend. Come and save me from the king of Aram and the king of Israel, who are attacking me. Ahaz took the silver and gold that was in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the palace, and he sent these as a gift to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria listened to Ahaz. He attacked Damascus and captured it and sent all its people away to Kir, and he killed Rezin. Then King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. Ahaz saw an altar at Damascus, and he sent plans and a pattern of this altar to Uriah the priest. So Uriah the priest built an altar just like the plans King Ahaz had sent him from Damascus. Uriah finished the altar before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. When the king arrived from Damascus, he saw the altar and went near and offered sacrifices on it. He burned his burnt offerings and grain offerings and poured out his drink offering. He also sprinkled the blood of his fellowship offerings on the altar. Ahaz moved the bronze altar that was before the Lord at the front of the temple. It was between Ahaz's altar and the temple of the Lord, but he put it on the north side of his altar. King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, on the large altar burned the morning burnt offering, the evening grain offering, the king's burnt offering and grain offering, and the whole burnt offering, the grain offering, and the drink offering for all the people of the land. Sprinkle on the altar all the blood of the burnt offering and of the sacrifice, but I will use the bronze altar to ask questions of God. So Uriah the priest did everything as King Ahaz commanded him. Then King Ahaz took off the side panels from the bases and removed the washing bowls from the top of the bases. He also took the large bowl, which was called the sea, off the bronze bulls that held it up, and he put it on a stone base. Ahaz took away the platform for the royal throne, which had been built at the temple of the Lord. He also took away the outside entrance for the king. He did these things because of the king of Assyria. The other things Ahad did as king are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Ahaz died and was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem, and Ahaz's son Hezekiah became king in his place. Chapter 17 Hoshea, son of Elah, became king over Israel during Ahaz's twelfth year as king of Judah. Hoshea ruled in Samaria nine years. He did what the Lord said was wrong, but he was not as bad as the kings of Israel who had ruled before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came to attack Hoshea. Hoshea had been Shalmaneser's servant and had made the payments to Shalmaneser that he had demanded. But the king of Assyria found out that Hoshea had made plans against him by sending messengers to So, the king of Egypt. Hoshea had also stopped giving Shalmaneser the payments which he had paid every year in the past. For that, the king put Hoshea in prison. Then the king of Assyria came and attacked all the land of Israel. He surrounded Samaria and attacked it for three years. He defeated Samaria in the ninth year Hoshea was king, and he took the Israelites away to Assyria. He settled them in Hala and Gozan on the Habor River and in the cities of the Medes. All these things happened because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. He had brought them out of Egypt and had rescued them from the power of the king of Egypt, but the Israelites had honored other gods. They lived like the nations the Lord had forced out of the land ahead of them. They lived as their evil kings had shown them, secretly sinning against the Lord their God. They built places to worship gods in all their cities, from the watchtower to the strong-walled city. They put up stone pillars to gods and Asherah idols on every high hill and under every green tree. 
the Israelites burned incense everywhere gods were worshipped, just as the nations who lived there before them had done, whom the Lord had forced out of the land. The Israelites did wicked things that made the Lord angry. They served idols when the Lord had said, You must not do this. The Lord used every prophet and seer to warn Israel and Judah. He said, Stop your evil ways and obey my commands and laws. Follow all the teachings that I commanded your ancestors, the teachings that I gave you through my servants, the prophets. But the people would not listen. They were stubborn, just as their ancestors had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected the Lord's laws and the agreement he had made with their ancestors, and they refused to listen to his warnings. They worshipped useless idols and became useless themselves. They did what the nations around them did, which the Lord had warned them not to do. The people rejected all the commands of the Lord their God. They molded statues of two calves and they made an Asherah idol. They worshipped all the stars of the sky and served Baal. They made their sons and daughters pass through fire and tried to find out the future by magic and witchcraft. They always chose to do what the Lord said was wrong, which made him angry. Because he was very angry with the people of Israel, he removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. But even Judah did not obey the commands of the Lord their God. They did what the Israelites had done. So the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He punished them and let others destroy them. He threw them out of his presence. When the Lord separated them from the family of David, the Israelites made Jeroboam son of Nebat their king. Jeroboam led the Israelites away from the Lord and led them to sin greatly. So they continued to do all the sins Jeroboam did. They did not stop doing these sins until the Lord removed the Israelites from his presence, just as he had said through all his servants, the prophets. So the Israelites were taken out of their land to Assyria, and they have been there to this day. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Cutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and put them in the cities of Samaria to replace the Israelites. These people took over Samaria and lived in the cities. At first, they did not worship the Lord, so he sent lions among them which killed some of them. The king of Assyria was told, you sent foreigners into the cities of Samaria who do not know the law of the God of the land. This is why he has sent lions among them. The lions are killing them because they don't know what the God wants. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send back one of the priests you took away. Let him live there and teach the people what the God wants. So one of the priests who had been carried away from Samaria returned to live in Bethel, and he taught the people how to honor the Lord. But each nation made gods of its own and put them in the cities where they lived and in the temples where gods were worshipped. These temples had been built by the Samaritans. The people from Babylon made Succoth Benoth their god. The people from Cutha worshipped Nergal. The people of Hamath worshipped Ashima. The Avites worshipped Nibhaz and Tartak. The Sepharvites burned their children in the fire, sacrificing them to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. They also honored the Lord, but they chose priests for the places where gods were worshipped. The priests were chosen from among themselves, and they made sacrifices for the people. The people honored the Lord, but also served their own gods, just as the nations did from which they had been brought. Even today they do as they did in the past. They do not worship the Lord nor obey his rules and commands. They do not obey the teachings or the commands of the Lord, which he gave to the children of Jacob, whom he had named Israel. The Lord had made an agreement with them and had commanded them, Do not honor other gods. Do not bow down to them or worship them or offer sacrifices to them. Worship the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and strength. 
bow down to him and offer sacrifices to him. Always obey the rules, orders, teachings, and commands he wrote for you. Do not honor other gods. Do not forget the agreement I made with you, and do not honor other gods. Instead, worship the Lord your God, who will save you from all your enemies. But the Israelites did not listen. They kept on doing the same things they had done before. So these nations honored the Lord, but also worshiped their idols, and their children and grandchildren still do as their ancestors did. Chapter 18 Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king during the third year Hoshea, son of Elah, was king of Israel. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. Hezekiah did what the Lord said was right, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the places where gods were worshipped. He smashed the stone pillars and cut down the Asher of idols. Also, the Israelites had been burning incense to Nehushtan, the bronze snake Moses had made, but Hezekiah broke it into pieces. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. Hezekiah was loyal to the Lord and did not stop following him. He obeyed the commands the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with Hezekiah, so he had success in everything he did. He turned against the king of Assyria and stopped serving him. Hezekiah defeated the Philistines all the way to Gaza and its borders, including the watchtowers and the strong walled cities. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, surrounded Samaria and attacked it in the fourth year Hezekiah was king. This was the seventh year Hoshea, son of Elah, was king of Israel. After three years, the Assyrians captured Samaria. This was in the sixth year Hezekiah was king, which was Hoshea's ninth year as king of Israel. The king of Assyria took the Israelites away to Assyria and settled them in Hala and Gozan on the Habor River and in the cities of the Medes. This happened because they did not obey the Lord their God. They broke his agreement and did not obey all that Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded. They would not listen to the commands or do them. During Hezekiah's fourteenth year as king, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the strong walled cities of Judah and captured them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent a message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. He said, I have done wrong. Leave me alone and I will pay anything you ask. So the king of Assyria made Hezekiah pay about 22,000 pounds of silver and 2,000 pounds of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasuries. Hezekiah stripped all the gold that covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord. Hezekiah had put gold on these doors himself, but he gave it all to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent out his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander. They went with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. When they came near the waterway from the upper pool on the road where people do their laundry, they stopped. They called for the king, so the king sent Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah out to meet them. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, was the palace manager. Shebna was the royal secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, was the recorder. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah this, The great king, the king of Assyria, says, What can you trust in now? You say you have battle plans and power for war, but your words mean nothing. Whom are you trusting for help so that you turn against me? Look, you are depending on Egypt to help you, but Egypt is like a splintered walking stick. If you lean on it for help, it will stab your hand and hurt you. The king of Egypt will hurt all those who depend on him. You might say, We are depending on the Lord our God, 
But Hezekiah destroyed the Lord's altars and the places of worship. Hezekiah told Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship only at this one altar in Jerusalem. Now make an agreement with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find enough men to ride them. You cannot defeat one of my master's least important officers. So why do you depend on Egypt to give you chariots and horsemen? I have not come to attack and destroy this place without an order from the Lord. The Lord himself told me to come to this country and destroy it. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to us in the Aramaic language. We understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew, because the people on the city wall can hear you. No, the commander said. My master did not send me to tell these things only to you and your king. He sent me to speak also to those people sitting on the wall who will have to eat their own dung and drink their own urine like you. Then the commander stood and shouted loudly in the Hebrew language, Listen to what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. The king says you should not let Hezekiah fool you because he can't save you from my power. Don't let Hezekiah talk you into trusting the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely save us. This city won't be handed over to the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah. The king of Assyria says, Make peace with me and come out of the city to me. Then everyone will be free to eat the fruit from his own grapevine and fig tree and to drink water from his own well. After that, I will come and take you to a land like your own, a land with grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olives and honey. Choose to live and not to die. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He is fooling you when he says, The Lord will save us. Has a God of any other nation saved his people from the power of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? They did not save Samaria from my power. Not one of all the gods of these countries has saved his people from me. Neither can the Lord save Jerusalem from my power. The people were silent. They didn't answer the commander at all because King Hezekiah had ordered, Don't answer him. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah tore their clothes to show how upset they were. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, was the palace manager. Shebna was the royal secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, was the recorder. The three men went to Hezekiah and told him what the field commander had said. Chapter 19 When King Hezekiah heard the message, he tore his clothes and put on rough cloth to show how sad he was. Then he went into the temple of the Lord. Hezekiah sent Eliakim, the palace manager, and Shebna, the royal secretary, and the older priests to Isaiah. They were all wearing rough cloth when they came to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. They told Isaiah, This is what Hezekiah says, Today is a day of sorrow and punishment and disgrace, as when a child should be born, but the mother is not strong enough to give birth to it. The king of Assyria sent his field commander to make fun of the living God. Maybe the Lord your God will hear what the commander said and will punish him for it. So pray for the few of us who are left alive. When Hezekiah's officers came to Isaiah, he said to them, Tell your master this. The Lord says, Don't be afraid of what you have heard. Don't be frightened by the words the servants of the king of Assyria have spoken against me. Listen, I am going to put a spirit in the king of Assyria. He will hear a report that will make him return to his own country, and I will cause him to die by the sword there. The field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish. When he went back, he found the king fighting against the city of Libna. The king received a report that Terhaka, the Cushite king of Egypt, was coming to attack him. 
When the king of Assyria heard this, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Tell Hezekiah, king of Judah, Don't be fooled by the God you trust. Don't believe him when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. You have heard what the kings of Assyria have done. They have completely defeated every country, so do not think you will be saved. Did the gods of those people save them? My ancestors destroyed them, defeating the cities of Gozan, Haran, and Rezeph, and the people of Eden living in Tel Asar. Where are the kings of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the kings of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? When Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the temple of the Lord. He spread the letter out before the Lord and prayed to the Lord. Lord God of Israel, whose throne is between the gold creatures with wings. Only you are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth. Hear, Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has said to insult the living God. It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed these countries and their lands. They have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire, but they were only wood and rock statues that people made. So the kings have destroyed them. Now, Lord our God, save us from the king's power, so that all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you, Lord, are the only God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah that said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is what the Lord has said against Sennacherib. The people of Jerusalem hate you and make fun of you. The people of Jerusalem laugh at you as you run away. You have insulted me and spoken against me. You have raised your voice against me. You have a proud look on your face which is against me, the Holy One of Israel. You have sent your messengers to insult the Lord. You have said, With my many chariots I have gone to the tops of the mountains, to the highest mountains of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars and its best pine trees. I have gone to its farthest places and to its best forests. I have dug wells in foreign countries and drunk water there. By the soles of my feet I have dried up all the rivers of Egypt. King of Assyria, surely you have heard. Long ago I, the Lord, planned these things. Long ago I designed them, and now I have made them happen. I allowed you to turn those strong walled cities into piles of rocks. The people in those cities were weak. They were frightened and put to shame. They were like grass in the field, like tender young grass, like grass on the housetop that is burned by the wind before it can grow. I know when you rest, when you come and go, and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me, and because I have heard your proud words, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. Then I will force you to leave my country the same way you came. Then the Lord said, Hezekiah, I will give you this sign. This year you will eat the grain that grows wild, and the second year you will eat what grows wild from that. But in the third year, plant grain and harvest it. Plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Some of the people in the family of Judah will escape. Like plants that take root, they will grow strong and have many children. A few people will come out of Jerusalem alive. A few from Mount Zion will live. The strong love of the Lord all-powerful will make this happen. So this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or even shoot an arrow here. He will not fight against it with shields or build a ramp to attack the city walls. He will return to his country the same way he came, and he will not enter this city, says the Lord. I will defend and save this city for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and killed 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up early the next morning, they saw all the dead bodies. 
So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, left and went back to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, as Sennacherib was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sharezer, killed him with a sword. Then they escaped to the land of Ararat. So Sennacherib's son, Esarhaddon, became king of Assyria. Chapter 20 At that time, Hezekiah became so sick he almost died. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to see him and told him, This is what the Lord says. Make arrangements because you are not going to live but die. Hezekiah turned toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, Lord, please remember that I have always obeyed you. I have given myself completely to you and have done what you said was right. Then Hezekiah cried loudly. Before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, the Lord spoke his word to Isaiah. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, so I will heal you. Three days from now you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. I will save you and this city from the king of Assyria. I will protect the city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Make a paste from figs. So they made it and put it on Hezekiah's boil, and he got well. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day? Isaiah said, the Lord will do what he says. This is the sign from the Lord to show you. Do you want the shadow to go forward ten steps or back ten steps? Hezekiah answered, It's easy for the shadow to go forward ten steps. Instead, let it go back ten steps. Then Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord, and the Lord brought the shadow ten steps back up the stairway of Ahaz that it had gone down. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, was king of Babylon. He sent letters and a gift to Hezekiah because he had heard that Hezekiah was sick. Hezekiah listened to the messengers, so he showed them what was in his storehouses, the silver, gold, spices, expensive perfumes, his swords and shields, and all his wealth. He showed them everything in his palace and his kingdom. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked him, What did these men say? Where did they come from? Hezekiah said, They came from a faraway country, from Babylon. So Isaiah asked him, What did they see in your palace? Hezekiah said, They saw everything in my palace. I showed them all my wealth. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Listen to the words of the Lord. In the future, everything in your palace and everything your ancestors have stored up until this day will be taken away to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your own children, those who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become servants in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah told Isaiah, These words from the Lord are good. He said this because he thought, there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Everything else Hezekiah did, all his victories, his work on the pool, his work on the tunnel to bring water into the city, is written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Then Hezekiah died, and his son Manasseh became king in his place. Chapter 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he was king 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did what the Lord said was wrong. He did the hateful things the other nations had done, the nations that the Lord had forced out of the land ahead of the Israelites. Manasseh's father, Hezekiah, had destroyed the places where gods were worshipped, but Manasseh rebuilt them. 
He built altars for Baal, and he made an Asherah idol as Ahab king of Israel had done. Manasseh also worshipped all the stars of the sky and served them. The Lord had said about the temple, I will be worshipped in Jerusalem. But Manasseh built altars in the temple of the Lord. He built altars to worship the stars in the two courtyards of the temple of the Lord. He made his own son pass through fire. He practiced magic and told the future by explaining signs and dreams. And he got advice from mediums and fortune tellers. He did many things the Lord said were wrong, which made the Lord angry. Manasseh carved an Asherah idol and put it in the temple. The Lord said to David and his son Solomon about the temple, I will be worshipped forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. I will never again make the Israelites wander out of the land I gave their ancestors, but they must obey everything I have commanded them and all the teachings my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen. Manasseh led them to do more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed ahead of the Israelites. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these hateful things. He has done more evil than the Amorites before him. He also has led Judah to sin with his idols. So this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will bring so much trouble on Jerusalem and Judah that anyone who hears about it will be shocked. I will stretch the measuring line of Samaria over Jerusalem, and the plumb line used against Ahab's family will be used on Jerusalem. I will wipe out Jerusalem as a person wipes a dish and turns it upside down. I will throw away the rest of my people who are left. I will give them to their enemies, and they will be robbed by all their enemies, because my people did what I said was wrong. They have made me angry from the day their ancestors left Egypt until now. Manasseh also killed many innocent people, filling Jerusalem from one end to the other with their blood. This was besides the sin he led Judah to do. He led Judah to do what the Lord said was wrong. The other things Manasseh did as king, even the sin he did, are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Manasseh died and was buried in the garden of his own palace, the garden of Uzzah. Then Manasseh's son, Ammon, became king in his place. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he was king for two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, daughter of Haraz, who was from Jotba. Ammon did what the Lord said was wrong, as his father Manasseh had done. He lived in the same way his father had lived. He worshipped the idols his father had worshipped, and he bowed down before them. Ammon rejected the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and did not follow the ways of the Lord. Ammon's officers made plans against him and killed him in his palace. Then the people of the land killed all those who had made plans to kill King Ammon and they made his son Josiah king in his place. Everything else Ammon did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. He was buried in his grave in the garden of Uzzah, and his son Josiah became king in his place. Chapter 22 Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he ruled 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, daughter of Adaiah, who was from Bozkath. Josiah did what the Lord said was right. He lived as his ancestor David had lived, and he did not stop doing what was right. In Josiah's 18th year as king, he sent Shaphan to the temple of the Lord. Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, was the royal secretary. Josiah said, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest and have him empty out the money the gatekeepers have gathered from the temple. This is the money they have brought into the temple of the Lord. Have him give the money to the supervisors of the work on the temple of the Lord. 
They must pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, builders, and bricklayers. Also use the money to buy timber and cut stone to repair the temple. They do not need to report how they use the money given to them, because they are working honestly. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the royal secretary, I've found the book of the teachings in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the royal secretary, went to the king and reported to Josiah, Your officers have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord. They have given it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the royal secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from the book to the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the teachings, he tore his clothes to show how upset he was. He gave orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Akbor son of Micaiah, Shaphan the royal secretary, and Isaiah the king's servant. These were the orders. Go and ask the Lord about the words in the book that was found. Ask for me, for all the people, and for all Judah. The Lord's anger is burning against us because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book. They did not do all the things written for us to do. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asaiah went to talk to Huldah the prophetess. She was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, the son of Harhas, who took care of the king's clothes. Huldah lived in Jerusalem in the new area of the city. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, This is what the Lord says. I will bring trouble to this place and to the people living here, as it is written in the book which the king of Judah has read. The people of Judah have left me and have burned incense to other gods. They have made me angry by all that they have done. My anger burns against this place like a fire, and it will not be put out. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to ask the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the words you heard. When you heard my words against this place and its people, you became sorry for what you had done and humbled yourself before me. I said they would be cursed and would be destroyed. You tore your clothes to show how upset you were, and you cried in my presence. This is why I have heard you, says the Lord. So I will let you die, and you will be buried in peace. You won't see all the trouble I will bring to this place. So they took her message back to the king. Chapter 23 Then the king gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem together. He went up to the temple of the Lord, and all the people from Judah and Jerusalem went with him. The priests, prophets, and all the people, from the least important to the most important, went with him. He read to them all the words of the book of the agreement that was found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made an agreement in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and obey his commands, rules, and laws with his whole being, and to obey the words of the agreement written in this book. Then all the people promised to obey the agreement. The king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the next rank and the gatekeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord everything made for Baal, Asherah, and all the stars of the sky. Then Josiah burned them outside Jerusalem in the open country of the Kidron Valley and carried their ashes to Bethel. The kings of Judah had chosen priests for these gods. These priests burned incense in the places where gods were worshipped in the cities of Judah and the towns around Jerusalem. They burned incense to Baal, the sun, the moon, the planets, and all the stars of the sky. But Josiah took those priests away. He removed the Asherah idol from the temple of the Lord and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley where he burned it and beat it into dust. Then he threw the dust on the graves of the common people. He also tore down the houses of the male prostitutes who were in the temple of the Lord, 
where the women did weaving for Asherah. King Josiah brought all the false priests from the cities of Judah. He ruined the places where gods were worshipped, where the priests had burned incense, from Geba to Beersheba. He destroyed the places of worship at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the ruler of the city, on the left side of the city gate. The priests at the places where the gods were worshipped were not allowed to serve at the Lord's altar in Jerusalem, but they could eat bread made without yeast with their brothers. Josiah ruined Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, so no one could sacrifice his son or daughter to Molech. Judah's kings had placed horses at the front door of the temple of the Lord in the courtyard near the room of Nathan, Melech, an officer. These horses were for the worship of the sun. So Josiah removed them and burned the chariots that were for sun worship also. The kings of Judah had built altars on the roof of the upstairs room of Ahaz. Josiah broke down these altars and the altars Manasseh had made in the two courtyards of the temple of the Lord. Josiah smashed them to pieces and threw their dust into the Kidron Valley. King Josiah ruined the places where gods were worshipped east of Jerusalem, south of the Mount of Olives. Solomon, king of Israel, had built these places. One was for Ashtoreth, the hated goddess of the Sidonians. One was for Chemosh, the hated god of Moab, and one was for Molech, the hated god of the Ammonites. Josiah smashed to pieces the stone pillars they worshipped, and he cut down the Asherah idols. Then he covered the places with human bones. Josiah also broke down the altar at Bethel, the place of worship made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had led Israel to sin. Josiah burned that place, broke the stones of the altar into pieces, then beat them into dust. He also burned the Asherah idol. When he turned around, he saw the graves on the mountain. He had the bones taken from the graves, and he burned them on the altar to ruin it. This happened as the Lord had said it would through the man of God. Josiah asked, What is that monument I see? The people of the city answered, it's the grave of the man of God who came from Judah. This prophet announced the things you have done against the altar of Bethel. Josiah said, Leave the grave alone. No one may move this man's bones. So they left his bones and the bones of the prophet who had come from Samaria. The kings of Israel had built temples for worshiping gods in the cities of Samaria, which had caused the Lord to be angry. Josiah removed all those temples and did the same things as he had done at Bethel. He killed all the priests of those places of worship. He killed them on the altars and burned human bones on the altars. Then he went back to Jerusalem. The king commanded all the people, Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the agreement. The Passover had not been celebrated like this since the judges led Israel nor had one like it happened while there were kings of Israel and kings of Judah. This Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem in the 18th year of King Josiah's rule. Josiah destroyed the mediums, fortune tellers, house gods, and idols. He also destroyed all the hated gods seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem. This was to obey the words of the teachings written in the book Hilkiah the priest had found in the temple of the Lord. There was no king like Josiah before or after him. He obeyed the Lord with all his heart, soul, and strength, following all the teachings of Moses. Even so, the Lord did not stop his strong and terrible anger. His anger burned against Judah because of all Manasseh had done to make him angry. The Lord said, I will send Judah out of my sight as I have sent Israel away. I will reject Jerusalem, which I chose, and I will take away the temple about which I said I will be worshipped there. Everything else Josiah did is written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. While Josiah was king, Necho, king of Egypt, went to help the king of Assyria at the Euphrates River. King Josiah marched out to fight against Necho, but at Megiddo, Necho faced him and killed him. 
Josiah's servants carried his body in a chariot from Megiddo to Jerusalem and buried him in his own grave. Then the people of Judah chose Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, and poured olive oil on him to make him king in his father's place. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he was king in Jerusalem for three months. His mother's name was Hamutal, who was the daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. Jehoahaz did what the Lord said was wrong, just as his ancestors had done. King Necho took Jehoahaz prisoner at Riblah in the land of Hamath, so that Jehoahaz could not rule in Jerusalem. Necho made the people of Judah pay about 7,500 pounds of silver and about 75 pounds of gold. King Necho made Josiah's son Eliakim the king in place of Josiah his father. Then Necho changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz to Egypt where he died. Jehoiakim gave King Necho the silver and gold he demanded. Jehoiakim taxed the land and took silver and gold from the people of the land to give to King Necho. Each person had to pay his share. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he was king in Jerusalem for 11 years. His mother's name was Zebedah, daughter of Padeah, who was from Rumah. Jehoiakim did what the Lord said was wrong, just as his ancestors had done. Chapter 24 While Jehoiakim was king, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked the land of Judah. So Jehoiakim became Nebuchadnezzar's servant for three years. Then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and broke away from his rule. The Lord sent raiding parties from Babylon, Aram, Moab, and Ammon against Jehoiakim to destroy Judah. This happened as the Lord had said it would through his servants, the prophets. The Lord commanded this to happen to the people of Judah to remove them from his presence because of all the sins of Manasseh. He had killed many innocent people and had filled Jerusalem with their blood, and the Lord would not forgive these sins. The other things that happened while Jehoiakim was king and all he did are written in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Jehoiakim died and his son Jehoiakim became king in his place. The king of Egypt did not leave his land again because the king of Babylon had captured all that belonged to the king of Egypt, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he was king three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, daughter of El Nathan from Jerusalem. Jehoiakim did what the Lord said was wrong, just as his father had done. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem. When they reached the city, they attacked it. Nebuchadnezzar himself came to the city while his officers were attacking it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, surrendered to the king of Babylon, along with Jehoiakim's mother, servants, nobles, and officers. So Nebuchadnezzar made Jehoiakim a prisoner in the eighth year he was king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar took all the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the palace. He cut up all the gold objects Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. This happened as the Lord had said it would. Nebuchadnezzar took away all the people of Jerusalem, including all the leaders, all the wealthy people, and all the craftsmen and metal workers. There were 10,000 prisoners in all. Only the poorest people in the land were left. Nebuchadnezzar carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, as well as the king's mother and his wives, the officers and the leading men of the land. They were taken captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. The king of Babylon also took all 7,000 soldiers who were strong and able to fight in war, and about a 1,000 craftsmen and metal workers. Nebuchadnezzar took them as prisoners to Babylon, then he made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in Jehoiakim's place. He also changed Mataniah's name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he was king in Jerusalem for 11 years. 
His mother's name was Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. Zedekiah did what the Lord said was wrong, just as Jehoiakim had done. All this happened in Jerusalem and Judah because the Lord was angry with them. Finally, he threw them out of his presence. Zedekiah turned against the king of Babylon. Chapter 25 Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army during Zedekiah's ninth year as king on the tenth day of the tenth month. He made a camp around the city and piled dirt against the city walls to attack it. The city was under attack until Zedekiah's eleventh year as king. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the hunger was terrible in the city. There was no food for the people to eat. Then the city was broken into, and the whole army ran away at night through the gate between the two walls by the king's garden. While the Babylonians were still surrounding the city, Zedekiah and his men ran away toward the Jordan Valley, but the Babylonian army chased King Zedekiah and caught up with him in the plains of Jericho. All of his army was scattered from him, so they captured Zedekiah and took him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. There he passed sentence on Zedekiah. They killed Zedekiah's sons as he watched. Then they put out his eyes and put bronze chains on him and took him to Babylon. Nebuzaradan was the commander of the king's special guards. This officer of the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem on the seventh day of the fifth month in Nebuchadnezzar's 19th year as king of Babylon. Nebuzaradan set fire to the temple of the Lord and the palace and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building was burned. The whole Babylonian army, led by the commander of the king's special guards, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guards, captured the people left in Jerusalem, those who had surrendered to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people of the land to take care of the vineyards and fields. The Babylonians broke up the bronze pillars, the bronze stands, and the large bronze bowl, which was called the sea, in the temple of the Lord. Then they carried the bronze to Babylon. They also took the pots, shovels, wick tremors, dishes, and all the bronze objects used to serve in the temple. The commander of the king's special guards took away the pans for carrying hot coals, the bowls, and everything made of pure gold or silver. There were two pillars and the large bronze bowl and the movable stands which Solomon had made for the temple of the Lord. There was so much bronze that it could not be weighed. Each pillar was about 27 feet high. The bronze capital on top of the pillar was about four and one half feet high. It was decorated with a net design and bronze pomegranates all around it. The other pillar also had a net design and was like the first pillar. The commander of the guards took some prisoners, Sariah the chief priest, Zephaniah the priest next in rank, and the three doorkeepers. Of the people who were still in the city, he took the officer in charge of the fighting men, as well as five people who advised to the king. He took the royal secretary who selected people for the army and sixty other men who were in the city. Nebuzaradan, the commander, took all these people and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. There at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, the king had them killed. So the people of Judah were led away from their country as captives. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, left some people in the land of Judah. He appointed Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, as governor. The army captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, so they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. They were Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, Johanan, son of Kareah, Sariah, son of Tanhumath, the Netophathite, Jaazaniah, son of the Maacathite, and their men. Then Gedaliah promised these army captains and their men, Don't be afraid of the Babylonian officers. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and everything will go well for you. 
In the seventh month, Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, son of Elishama, from the king's family, came with ten men and killed Gedaliah. They also killed the men of Judah and Babylon who were with Gedaliah at Mizpah. Then all the people, from the least important to the most important, along with the army leaders, ran away to Egypt because they were afraid of the Babylonians. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, was held in Babylon for 37 years. In the 37th year, Evil Merodach became king of Babylon, and he let Jehoiakim out of prison on the 27th day of the 12th month. Evil Merodach spoke kindly to Jehoiakim and gave him a seat of honor above the seats of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put away his prison clothes. For the rest of his life, he ate at the king's table. Every day, for as long as Jehoiakim lived, the king gave him an allowance. We'd like to thank you for joining the FP Network today, where we are loving God, loving people, and treasuring Jesus together.